Hello, I'm Anaboltus, and today I am going to be explaining my theory of normative ethics, at least the ones that I use in the construction of uh, my particular ideology. Because I noted that, uh, uh, at least from my limited knowledge of uh, normative ethical theories, that mine is one that uh, is... A, if it is one that already exists, is not one that is widely known. So I want to be uh, to examine it to some extent. So I have dubbed mine the imperial theory of ethics, and the reason why it's called imperial is because it is all uh, based on an idea of uh, interlocking levels of authority and uh, imperatives that are then derived from that. So it is in some ways deontological and in another way uh, has some elements of consequentialism in it. Uh, however, the consequential element of that is based upon a deontology. So ultimately speaking, it uh, is primarily deontological with uh, some elements of consequentialism in it. So the idea here, uh, let me just be very clear, that I make an equation between the idea of justice and righteousness, justness and rightness. I make an equation of these ideas. So to be therefore unjust is to also be unrighteous. So that's an equation I make as a uh, sort of a presupposition of this idea that justice and righteousness are the same in their qualities, even if they're not the same in their uses. As in, they might have a different uh, particular use here and there, but uh, they are the same in their qualities. Now, when it concerns the ethical system in itself, it is derived on the idea that uh, authorities are established uh, by means of power. So you have power, and by means of that power, an authority is established, and that authority uh, in the region that it has power over, therefore also acquires a jurisdiction. So you have uh, power generates authority, authority generates jurisdiction, and jurisdiction generates the imperative. That is to say, the requirement of individuals to obey. So there are four responses that can exist to the imperative. One is the direct obedience or loyalty to that imperative uh, in the sense that a person sees that individual as being a legitimate authority over oneself and therefore obeys that authority uh, um, going forward. In this, and this could in some ways be linked to a love for the authority, although that is not necessarily true. Now, the second one is uh, the obedience as a result of an understanding of the consequence of disobeying the imperative. So this here is the consequential element where the individual is not uh, proactively obeying the authority that is placed above him, but instead is obeying it only as a result of the knowledge of the consequence of disobedience. So that is the second type of response to the authority. The third type of response to the authority is a disobedience to the imperative, but obedience to the consequential imperative, uh, which would be in the instance of civil disobedience, where individuals uh, break the law, however, they accept the consequences that are placed upon them for breaking the law, which themselves are an additional imperative. Uh, and then the fourth one is a disobedience of the imperative and a disobedience of the consequential imperative, uh, which is uh, open rebellion and is therefore seen, seeing as it is a subversion of uh, the imperative, which therefore is also a subversion 
of the jurisdiction, which is a subversion of the authority, which indicates a subversion of justice, which also is a subversion of righteousness, is therefore considered to be an evil act, uh, as well as the civil disobedience, however, to a lesser degree, because uh, the imperative is only in part rejected. So in, in that sense, I see this system as a system that is descriptive in some way of uh, how uh, states operate in the sense that if a state does not operate in this way, then it is disadvantageous to the operation of a state. That is to say that a state ideally would prefer to have individuals obey the laws uh, out of loyalty to the state. Uh, secondarily, they would want them to obey the laws out of fear of the consequences of disobedience. And they also would not like individuals to disobey the laws. However, uh, in the case that individuals disobey the laws, they would be willing to punish those individuals because if they don't, then it undermines their jurisdiction. And finally, if an individual disobeys the laws and does not submit to the punishment imposed by the state, then the state requires an escalation of force in order to lead to that uh, obedience or to the end of the individual who has disobeyed. So in a very real sense, let's say someone uh, breaks the speed limit and the police want to pull that individual over. So the individual has broken the speed limit and for that reason, that individual is now being pursued by the police. But the individual refuses the authority of the police in order to uh, for the police to punish that individual for the speeding, which means that an escalation occurs. The police now chases. The individual still does not stop. And if the individual is... Uh, apprehended the individual continues to defend himself from the force of the police, then the police may have to escalate further. And this escalation, the ultimate point of it is uh, death of one party or the other. In other words, it becomes a battle where either the police wins or whether, or, or in the other case, the criminal wins. And this is important for the establishment of justice, that this type of escalation should always be an option. Because if it is not an option, what occurs is, let's say, by an act of civil disobedience, the jurisdiction is eroded. And if the jurisdiction is eroded, the authority is eroded. And, and that is because the government does not give itself, in that instance, the power to respond to an, a, a breaking of the law, which means that the authority and the jurisdiction of a government is undermined. So I think it's very important that a government should always be able to escalate as far as necessary in order to ensure that criminals are stopped by uh, whatever means are necessary. Now, this is not to say that the end justifies the means or to say that there is no higher level of authority that a state would be beholden to, because as someone who is uh, a religious myself, I view an authority as existing above the state and that authority by virtue of having infinite power and the ability to punish crimes to an infinite extent is therefore the ultimate authority to which uh, obeisance is owed. In other words, it uh, is uh, that authority to which obeisance is owed. Now, that being said, how is my theory of, uh, of normative ethics different from divine command theory? What makes mine different? What makes mine different is the idea that uh, the authority of the state is established by the same means as the authority of the divine command. However, uh, the authority of the state is not explicitly dependent on the authority of the divine command, excepting, uh, obviously, 
the providence thereof. Now, this means that my theory is adaptable to uh, atheistic systems as well and is acceptable to those as well. And it also means that ultimately I see the authority of God as being one that is derived from his power and his ability to punish those who disobey him. Uh, that is my particular view on the origin of that authority and that theory is equal or uh, is a, a macrocosm of the microcosm of the authority of the state which is seen as uh, having power to punish crimes and therefore to establish its own jurisdiction. So uh, tell me what you think on my theory of normative ethics. Uh, do you like my imperial theory? Is Do you think that there's a different theory that is superior? Um, I certainly don't think Kantian uh, theory is a superior. I, and I have obviously voiced my disagreement with uh, that of natural rights. And there are other uh, theories as well that exist. But I think my theory is... Uh, it has a great validity in the sense that it is functionally true, in the sense that there is an element of obedience due to the established authority. There's also an element of uh, the consequentialism that actually drives individuals in how they act. So I think that my particular theory of normative ethics is one that is therefore accurate to the real world and therefore is a realist theory in that sense. Now that being said, my theory, due to the primary reaction that is obedience and the secondary reaction which is uh, uh, the um, consequential element, due to obedience uh, being preferred to the consequential element, my theory is very uh, anti-insurrection in the sense that uh, I I view, let's say, a revolution rising up and therefore people taking power to overthrow an existing power as therefore being immoral or because it, dis it disestablishes the existing power. And by disestablishing the existing power, you are therefore in violation of of the existing justice uh, and therefore that places you in a situation where your change of power ultimately causes a um, an unrighteous event or an unjust event. Now that being said, there is also the element of lawful replacement of power in the sense that the existing power has a uh, established a means by which it may be replaced without subverting its own system of justice. And I think that's acceptable. And I will also say that even though my theory is called imperial ethics in the sense that there is an imperative, this imperative is not necessarily held by a monarch. And in fact, my ideal system does not have it uh, held uh, by a monarch as so insofar as it concerns the state. But it can also be held by uh, uh, democratic means or by other means as well. So just because it's called imperial does not mean that it is necessarily uh, require an emperor per se. So I want to make that point very clear. This is not a monarchist or reactionist um, normative theory of ethics, but rather one that... Uh, attempts to be realist and also attempts to create a situation in which uh, order exists in a society and in which uh, revolutions that are destructive to society do not occur. And uh, the reason I made this video in the first place is because I wanted to talk about nationalism and uh, I thought that it would be best to expound on my theory of normative ethics before I talk about nationalism, because uh, I think that whatever your normative ethics are, are very relevant to how you would either justify or de-justify varying forms of nationalism. Because uh, getting your ethics straight allows you to then decide which types of state 
are ethical in the sense that they are states that are good to have or states that are bad to have, states that are good to establish, states that are bad to establish. Now, I also, one aspect that I did not mention is decaying authority, in which case, uh, let's say, the late Roman Empire, where they were pulling troops back from various regions, which meant that their uh, real uh, power in the region ceased to exist, for example, famously in Britain, uh, in that sense, I would say view that as a contraction of their authority uh, because they ceased to continually establish their authority in that region and therefore they reduced their jurisdiction in some respect. Now, this also has to do with uh, Britain rebelling uh, in the sense that an emperor rose up in Britain and, and then moved to the mainland, but was defeated. But Britain was never reunited with the rest of the empire. So that's another historical element to look at. However, I will say that uh, there have been situations where empires get overextended and they eventually lose their ability to control their frontier regions. And I think the establishment of, uh, of order in those regions is in some ways uh, important. For example, let's say today the United States collapsed for some reason and the government wasn't able to control the country. Would it be uh, allowable for uh, new authorities to establish themselves in, in lieu of the United States uh, authority and jurisdiction having been disestablished. I think it would be acceptable insofar as it acknowledges that the previous authority is a legitimate authority and existed in the sense that then this is something that is open to negotiation, where if de facto what has occurred is that the new authority is established without requiring any rebellion or any revolution or any disestablishment of the old authority and therefore is by de facto a uh, separate authority. I would consider that to be a legitimate authority in its own right. So anyway, thank you all for watching and I'll be seeing you all next time on a Wiltus over and out.